one of the one of the devices that I enjoy the most is my uh, my GPS. I love my GPS. I don't know what I would do without my GPS. Well, I do know I would get lost. That's just obvious. I remember when I became pastor, I, I was uh, had to learn the area because I'm from Western New York. So I had to learn this area better and. I would drive places, and thank God I had a map with me, one of those like sectional maps, you know, it breaks everything down. So I would get lost, but I learned that I was pretty good at reading maps. But of course, I would have to stop, look at the street, oh my goodness, is it this? Yeah, this is definitely it, okay, and then I can move on. And it was a hassle. It's great now when I get into a car, you just program the address, and you know, there it goes. It takes me to uh, where I need to go. And uh, I mean, of course, the GPS can also have problems. Like, you know, when GPS gets older, it tries to take you to a road that no longer exists and that no matter how much you're trying to maneuver around it, it's still trying to take you back to that point to take you to a road that doesn't exist anymore. But you kind of, you kind of realize the importance of, of having the right directions and going the right way and unfortunately you know, how horrible it is to get lost. For Paul, he never imagined that he was lost. If you had asked Paul before he met Jesus what he thought of himself, well, he tells us. He tells us in Philippians 3, he says, Mind you, I've got good reason to trust in the flesh. If anyone else thinks they have reason to trust in the flesh, I've got more. Circumcised on the eighth day, raised Israelite, tribe Benjamin, descent Hebrew through and through, Torah observance a Pharisee, zealous I persecuted the church, official status under the law, blameless. Official status under the law, blameless. Paul had no doubt that he was right with God, that he was perfectly aligned with the law, that he was great, and that he had all the right stripes to say, I am part of the elect, I'm part of the chosen. Of course, that all went horribly wrong on the road to Damascus. <laughs> you know, on the road to Damascus, he encountered the living Christ, and all suddenly his world just fell apart. And had to be rebuilt. At that point he realized just how lost he was. At that point he realized he had misread the map. He had to go back to the Hebrew scriptures. And read them again. Only now through the reality that Christ is the Messiah. That Christ is the anointed of God. That Christ is the one. The interpretive lens by which we can tell the Hebrew scriptures. If you read the Hebrew scriptures without Jesus you're not going to get it. You're going to end up with many theories and many things, but you're going to miss how it's all connected. Paul now went back with Jesus and realized, oh my goodness, this is how it all makes sense. He understood that the Christians had gotten it right because they were talking about a living Messiah. That this indeed was the Messiah of God, that he had come to redeem us. And of course, this meant that now when he back, went back to the Hebrew Scriptures, things got redefined. And one of the things that got redefined is, who are the people of God? Who are the people of God? Remember he told us in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. A person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. He had already told us this. Now in chapters 9 to 11, he is going to deal with this issue of who really is Israel. And of course, this passage is a passage that's like everywhere you turn, there's a landmine. Because people have been so, has take, taken these passages, especially Romans 9, and made it issues about predestination. Who are the elect? Who are the damned? Who did God pick from all eternity to go to heaven? Who did God pick from all eternity to go to hell? And if you know nothing about this, you are blessed. If I'm talking to you and it's just sounding like gibberish right now, you are one of the blessed ones. Because you have the opportunity to look at this with fresh eyes. It took me, just like Paul, it took me a long time. Because when I was reading Paul, I was already reading it through the mindset that this is what it was talking about. And this is what I have been taught. And to go back and see, what is Paul saying? And what is Paul talking about? Paul's not talking about issues of predestination. Well, yes, he is. But not in the way we think. He wants to define who are the people of God. How can we identify them? 
How do we know if we really are part of the people of God or not? And the issue that he has to address here is the issue that the Jews are bringing up to him. In the debates that he had, one of the things that would have come up is, Paul, if what you're saying is true, if God is now this kind of God who's reaching out to everybody, and that means that Gentiles, that means you, me, we're Gentiles, that we can be part of the family of God, that they can be part of the family just like a Jew, that a Jew and a Gentile can stand together and call each other brother and that they are united in, as one, none being higher than the other. How is that possible, Paul? If that's true, then God has failed in his promises to Israel, which is something you still hear today. You still hear people saying, if Israel doesn't have a special place and if Israel doesn't have this and Israel doesn't have that, then God's promises have failed. I'm going to show you that God's promises have not failed. Well, Paul's going to show you God's promises have not failed. And if you want to get angry, just... Get angry with Paul. Don't get angry with me. And, or, or at least show me that I'm, doing, that I'm misunderstanding Paul. I think I'm, I'm understanding Paul correctly. What he's saying is, this is who Israel is. Look, look at the premise. Look at what he begins and look at how he defends it. So we can understand why we, you and I, are part of the people of God. Why any Jew who believes in Christ is part of the people of God. And anyone who does not believe in Christ, no matter who they are ethnically, is outside the boundaries of salvation, outside the boundaries of Christ. Because, and here I'm going to tell you the answer before we even go through the whole thing, because salvation is by grace. It is by grace. It's not because of your biology. It's not because of your ethnics, ethnic background. It's not because you can keep the law. It's because of the grace of God coming to us. And that's what this whole beginning is all about. But look how he starts. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Right there, if you skip that premise, and so many do, they skip that verse and they keep on talking about everything else, but they miss that verse. That's his thesis. If there's a thesis, there it is. Not all Israel is Israel. Simply because you're biologically part of the thing called Israel does not mean that you're part of the people of God. It takes more to be part of the people of God than simply say, I was born into it, which is what many people do. You know, of course, we can say that about our nationality. Anybody born in Cuba is a Cuban. Anybody born in America is an American. But we wouldn't say that everyone is a Christian simply because they're born to a Christian family. We wouldn't say, oh, oh you know, my daughter was born into my family, therefore she's automatically a Christian. Of course not. Because we know that Christianity entails a decision, a choice. Now, she's blessed because she's part of a covenant family. She's part of a family that is dedicated to Christ, and therefore she's under the grace of God, but she still has to make that choice. But in the ancient world, that was not the idea. The idea is that, oh, if you're born into it, you're okay. And if you're not born into it, well, too bad. So just by the fact that you're born Gentile, bad luck for you. You're born a Jew, you're blessed. And Paul's going to say, no, 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 no. And the Bible shows that that is not true. Not, not, not the New Testament, the Old Testament. He's going to be quoting the Old Testament saying, this is not the way God works. This is the way God has never worked. God has worked differently every single time. But the first thing he says, God's word has not failed. And that's so important. In Isaiah 55, verses 10 11 says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose, purpose for which I send it. Paul would say, God's word does not fail. Amen? It never fails. Amen? But what does fail are the interpretations of men. When you go to the word of God and you take it out of context and you pull this out and you pull that out and you begin to make it say whatever you want to say, then yes, it will fail. Like when people quote something like Psalm 91, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so you will not strike your foot against a stone. And you take a verse like I say, ah, I see, I can go out there and I can jump out of a plane and I can do this and I can do that and I'll be fine. Because God will protect me. God will take care of me. This is the temptation that Christ faced. Remember? The devil said to him, doesn't the Bible say? 
jump off this mountain, jump off this cliff, and you'll be fine. He will hold you up. And what does Jesus answer? The word also says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It's looking at the word of God entirely, not just one segment. But people, unfortunately, take one passage, one thing, and they run with it. They run with it. They find one verse that says something even, even similar to what they think it should say, or it will help their beliefs, and they're off. Forget about properly studying the passage. Forget about properly looking at the context. Forget about anything. They just run off with it. And that's why it's bad to read the Bible that way. So here's, a, here's a good trick. Don't read the Bible that way. When you read the Bible, read it from cover to cover. I know that's tedious. You know, we live in an age where people cannot focus. They have to jump around. You know, they watch five minutes TV here. You know, it's, like, it's like TV, if you notice, we have to jump around. You know, I'm watching a program, but I got to check what's on channel, whatever. I can flip back and forth. We cannot focus. We cannot stay on one thing. In the Bible, we treat it the same way. We pick it up like, you know, oh, see what that word says? That word is for me. Oh, God help you. God help you. You know, you know the joke that I've always said about that thing, when, you know, that great joke said, somebody opened the Bible and said, you know, they point and says, and Judas went and hung himself. <gasps> oh, that, 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 that can't be for me. You know, that, that verse can't, let me, you know, go ye and do likewise. You know, come on. We're playing with the word of God. It's the word of God. We need to take it seriously and study it. When we're doing Romans, we should be studying Romans, reading Romans, understanding Romans. And then we come to it. But if we are taking the word of God like that and pulling it apart simply to support our theology, don't be shocked when it fails. The word of God did not fail. Your interpretation of God's word failed. And that's what Paul discovered for himself. He discovered that he was wrong. And that simply being a descendant of Israel did not automatically save you. It did not automatically con uh, conclude that you were part of the elect. That there had to be something more to it than that. And of course, the thing they had to do was to be aware that salvation is by the grace of God. God is the one who gets to define how his people will be defined, who his people will be. He gets to say it because all of us are sinners, all of us are fallen, and he says salvation is through Christ. He defines it. We don't get to define it. And we either accept it or we reject it. And if you reject it, you're not part of the covenant people of God. But Paul is here showing us that indeed there is a true Israel, a true people of God. And here, A. Chakwit Thornhill, who's written a fantastic book, but I'm actually reading from his, uh, his doctoral thesis, states, Here Paul clearly evidences a belief in a true Israel. From the previous examination of Jewish literature of the period, it should be readily recognized that the limiting of the true Israel was quite common during the Second Temple period. Now that might mean nothing to you, but what it means is this. In that period of time, it was very common to talk about a true Israel and a false Israel. The Pharisees believed that. The Pharisees believed that they were the elect, and that if you were not with them, you were not part of the elect. It didn't matter that you were Jewish. If you were a Sadducee, it didn't matter that you were a Sadducee and you were Jewish also. You're not a Pharisee, you're not elect. The Essenes thought the same thing. We are the true people of God. Everybody else is not the true people of God. Paul is not doing anything different here. Only he's changing the parameters, the real parameters, and saying, no, we're not. The defining of God's people is not according to ethnic groups. It's according to grace. So that anybody... No matter what ethnic background you're from, doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, doesn't matter if you're male or female, your salvation is through Jesus Christ. And when you come in, you come on equal footing. Everyone can be saved. Now, Paul will be shocked today. I believe he will be shocked by many things, but he will be shocked definitely by the fact that today we talk about the church and the Israel of God as if they were two different things. Not for Paul. For Paul, the church is the Israel of God. It's the continuation of the, of the people of God. You know, think about it. It's not like God said, well, here's my plan. I'm going to raise up Abraham. I'm going to have this great plan of salvation. I'm going to work it all through. And then, uh-oh, it all messed up. So he said, oh, you know what? Forget this plan. That's our new plan. We'll call it the church. No. Israel failed. 
Israel messed up. God remained faithful to Israel. And through one Israelite, the seed of Abraham, who is Jesus, he brought salvation to the world. He did exactly what Israel was supposed to do. Israel could not do it. They kept messing up. God came in himself, took on bodily form, and fulfilled the promises and fulfilled the covenant that Israel was supposed to fulfill. And we're going to look at that when we look at Romans 10 and see that Christ is the one who has completely fulfilled the law so that we don't have to. So that salvation is through him. But Paul right here shows, is stating that salvation is not by ethnic background. It's not by biology. It's not because my mom's a Jew or my dad's a Jew. It's not because I am circumcised. No. It has to be circumcision of the heart. It has to be a transformation of the heart. It's a new covenant that God spoke about in the Old Testament. He told them in the Old Testament, you're not going to be able to keep the covenant. You're going to continue to be unfaithful. I will do for you what you're not doing. I will bring about salvation. It's my arm that will bring about salvation, not yours. So at the end, we cannot boast. Anybody here who thinks they can boast, you're fooling yourself. When Paul thought he could boast, he was fooling himself. There is nothing we can do to earn our salvation. There is nothing we do to save ourselves. It's all by grace. And that's what Paul is pointing to. But he's going to use an incredible argument that's going to trap the very Jewish people that would be arguing with him. And he begins, of course, with the whole Isaac Ishmael uh, comparison. Look at verses 7 through 9. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it's the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Now if Jewish people were listening to that, they'd be like, Amen. Because they don't see the trap. You know, he's throwing it in there and like a little fish, they see the, the little gold thing and they're like, oh, oh yeah, we agree with that. You're right, brother. The promise is through Isaac, not through Ishmael. Yeah, Ishmael is the heathen, the pagans, the rejected of God. Isaac, all salvation, all grace, all things are through Isaac. But of course, they don't realize that they have, not fought, that they have fallen into the first trap that Paul was making for them. Because Paul's basically saying, by admitting that Ishmael is not the one, you're admitting that it's not by physical descent. Because Ishmael is the son of Abraham. I am shocked when I see Christians talking like Ishmael was born by something else. Like he's not an heir to Abraham. Let me put it this way. Think about it. Ishmael is the firstborn of Abraham. Think about it. Let that settle in. People don't get it. He is the firstborn. By all rights, he is the heir, not Isaac. By Jewish law, he is the heir. It doesn't matter that his mother is Hagar. His father is Abraham. The seed goes through the father, not by the mother. <laughs> and they would say, oh my goodness, this is the one. And yet, not according to God. Because God is working something, something different. Not because he's rejecting Ishmael as a person. On the contrary, if you read the Hebrew Scriptures, you see that God embraced Ishmael. He blesses him. He blesses his mother. He says, I will make a great nation out of you. And we see that as well. It's not only Isaac that was blessed. Ishmael was blessed. But the covenant promise of salvation comes through Isaac. Not through Ishmael. Why? Because it cannot depend on the power of man. When Abraham had Ishmael, he was still vibrant. He could still have children. And he bore him still in his power. Thirteen years later, when he's, when he's going to have Isaac, he's like, uh, I'm lifeless. You know, that's a nice way of saying it. Oh, I can't have children. My body's as good as dead and my poor wife, well, she's not doing too well either. Sarah was never able to have children. Abraham can no longer bear them. Ishmael came still when he had his vigor. But God says no because it's going to come through the promise. What does that mean? It means that it's going to be by my grace and by my power. 
Think about it. When you cannot do it, Abraham, when Sarah cannot do it, I will do it. I will bring about the promise. I will bring about salvation. I will bring the child that's going to transform things. Not you. It's, you know, and of course, we find that in the New Testament where it tells us that we're not saved by our own might, by our own power, by our own skills. It's not because I'm very intelligent that I'm saved. It's not because, oh my goodness, I'm so cute that God just had to accept me. I'm so adorable, I'm so beautiful that God had to elect me. Oh, it's because I'm so, I'm so wonderful. It's because God knows I can really do a lot of work for him that he elects me. No, it's by grace. We're all sinners. We're all messed up. And this is the message that comes through Isaac. You know, we always think that, in the, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, that things are automatically a certain way. We always think, you know, we were talking last week about the firstborn, which Sergei came, actually had a great theological insight, which was beautiful. Ask him to share it with you because it was very powerful and it was just like, wow, he has been making me think about, yes, how in Christ we have all become firstborn. You know, I'm not firstborn in my family, but I thought it was a beautiful thought that because of who Christ is and what he's done, I am like a firstborn child now. He can share that with us. It's not my thought, it's his. And it's beautiful. But, but God shows that he doesn't always work this way, that he turns the tables. He doesn't always work through the firstborn or the secondborn, sometimes even the thirdborn. Remember the story of David? Samuel's told, go down and anoint the new king of Israel. So he goes to Jesse, who's got eight boys. Wow, he's got a baseball team. The man is incredible. Eight boys. And of course, when he sees Samuel coming, he has, prepares a meal. He's so happy. And when Samuel sees Eliab, he says to himself, oh, this must be the anointed of God. Look how strong, look how incredible. And God says to him, to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God is not impressed by the fact that you have incredible physical structure, that you're so beautiful, that you're so talented, that you're so smart. He's concerned about the heart. And just like that, seven sons pass in front of Samuel. And they ask Jesse, Jesse, no more boys? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got one more. Oh, yeah? Why is he not here? Why is he not at the meal with us? Oh, he's taking care of the sheep. And when Samuel sees David, God says, that's the one, anoint him. God does this. God doesn't do it the way we imagine that he does it. We cannot tell God how to do things. I cannot go to God and say, God, no, no, no. You're going to have to save people this way. You know, save them through the line of me. <laughs> save them because they're all Cuban. All Cuban people are elect. They're all saved. We're all going to make it. The rest of you, too bad. Or God, just do it because we are the Cubans that can keep the right rituals and the right things and the right laws. See how ludicrous it sounds? Now, when you turn around and say Israel, people say, oh, it sounds okay. No, it does. It sounds the same thing as you say Cuba. That I'm just saved because I'm Cuban. You say, no. <laughs> Maybe you're Irish, but not Cuban. You know? It's almost like, why, why, is, why is my country less? That we can't say that about them. And God says, no, this is not the way I'm going to work. It has nothing to do with the national Israel. It has to do with the heart. It has to do with what is going on in their heart, whether they will reject me or accept me. If you reject the Lord, then of course, you're not part of the elect. If you accept the Lord, you are his people. But now Paul takes it to a second level. Now he's going to hit them right at juggler. We already know where he's going, because I'm telling you where he's going, what he's doing, but they don't know this. But look at the second example. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac, Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works or by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. You see, they could have said, well, you see, Isaac and Ishmael have different moms. So it makes sense that the line is from Isaac, not from Ishmael. And Paul turns around and says, what about Jacob and Esau? Esau came out first. J 
Jacob was holding on to the heel. That's why they call him Jacob, because he's holding on to the heel. And he's a deceiver and a liar, doing everything possibly wrong. And yet God's salvation will come through him, not through Esau. And yet they have the same mother, and Jacob is not the firstborn. And Esau is rejected because of his rejection of God. Don't think that Esau is being rejected just because God is fickle and hates him. He's rejected because he doesn't consider the things of God important. Ah, oh, my birthright. Man, when I, I remember when I first read that and I understood what a birthright was. I was like, wow, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually the second son in my family, not the first son. And if my brother, I said, man, if, I could, if, I, if I, there was still a, a, a way of doing this, I would will, will give him lentils. <laughs> Here, brother, <laughs> give me that blessing. I want the blessing of God. Wouldn't you want that? To know that you had the blessing of God just because you're the first male? Wow, and you're going to sell it for a bowl of lentils? That's how cheaply Esau saw the things of God, but not Jacob. Despite the fact that he's being dishonest, and doing it in a crooked way, he still thinks the things of God are great. And he wants them. I want the blessing of God. And I'll take it by any means possible. Now, for the Israelites, of course, they believe that when you're, as again, if you're born a Jew, you stay a Jew, you're part of the covenant people of God, the only way you can lose it is by abandoning the law, abandoning the things of God. And Paul says, no. Right from the beginning, you have, it has to be by grace. Because here are two that are born into. So, of course, in the first century, just like before, the story of Jacob and Esau was used about those who kept the law and didn't keep the law. Jacob was being portrayed as someone who kept the law. Now, the problem is, Jacob exists 400 years before the law. But he's still portrayed as someone who's a law keeper. And Esau was portrayed as someone who was a law breaker. He was seen as someone who gained his wealth by evil means. He was seen as a fornicator and idolater. And of course, he married foreign women. That's a no-no. And again, as A. Chadwick Thornhill states, Esau was not chosen because God knew his unrighteous and violent ways, while Jacob observed the Sabbath, festival of weeks, separated himself from the Gentiles, abstained from idolatry, did not marry Gentile wives, tithed unto the Lord. This is the background that Paul is dealing with. Thorn Thornhill goes on to say, It can be suggested then, that Paul employs the Isaac, Ishmael, and Jacob, Esau motif, a motif familiar already in Jewish literature at the time, in order to describe them as representative heads of collective groups. He's not using them as individuals, but as types of the people of God and those who reject God. It has nothing to do with Ishmael. It has nothing to do with Isaac. It has nothing to do with Jacob or Esau. It has to do with, with what they represent. They represent those who reject the things of God and those who accept the things of God. And that's what he's talking about. Which means today, things could be turned completely around. And let me tell you something. If I, if I haven't offended anybody, I might just offend you now. Oh, hopefully not, because I don't think anybody here should be offended. But That means that today, if you find a Palestinian who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he's part of Isaac. He's part of Jacob. And when you look at a Jew who's rejected Jesus Christ, he is Ishmael. He is Esau. That's what Paul's saying. Do you know now why they hate the man? Why they're trying to kill Paul? I always like it when they make it sound like Paul's such a peaceful guy. You know, Paul is, is stating a radical theology. And this is why he's hated by the Jews and they want to kill him because he's pronouncing... You guys are Jews, but it means nothing without Jesus. You have to accept Christ. And we get this issue here, of course, of Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated. I want to, you know, let's, we can move quickly through that because this is not talking about emotional love and hate. I hope, you know, I've talked to you about this before. Love and hate is covenant language. Actually, what he's calling from Malachi, it's no longer talking about the individuals, but the individuals are no longer alive. It's talking about the, the people they represent. It means that those who are like Jacob have a covenant with God. And those who are not like Jacob are rejected. They're hated. That's what love and hate mean for the Hebrew. Love means I choose this one. Hate means I reject that one. 
That's why Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you must hate your mother and your father. It doesn't mean, you know, I go home and say, Mom, I hate you. God told me to, Mom, I'm sorry. I have to hate you. Dad, I hate your guts. No, that's not what it means. It means God is first in my life. My covenant is with him, not with you, Mom, not with you, Dad. My faithfulness is first and foremost to him. I obey you, Mom. I obey you, Dad, as long as you are okay with God. But if you tell me to do something that's contrary to God, I will not follow you. That's what love and hate refers to. Now, in Scripture, it becomes very obvious that when it comes to emotional issues, God loves everyone. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. How long have we not quoted that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to salvation. God desires for everyone to repent, for everyone to be saved. And he's made a means to do it. But here's the trick. Here's the catch. You can only do it by coming through Christ. See, God gets to decide what door we have to walk through, not us. We don't get to decide whether it's through ethnic groups or we don't get to decide whether it's by keeping the law. It is by Jesus Christ. That is the means that he's done. And if we don't do that, then we're not righteous. We're not right with God. You see that in the parable, when Jesus gives the parable in, in Luke chapter 18, he talks to people who are confident, the Bible says, in their own righteousness. They're confident thinking that they are right with God. And there are many people like that today. They don't go to church. They don't read the Bible. They don't pray, but they're Christian. And they're confident of their salvation. They're confident that if they were to die today, they would stand before God and God would say, Oh, por favor, entra. You know? You're welcomed. We were waiting for you, Your Highness. They treat God like somehow God owes them and they get to decide how to declare righteousness. And Paul and Jesus gives this parable, which is still applicable today. Two men go to the temple to pray. The one is a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee goes to pray. And he has no problem going forward. He's standing up, raises his hand. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Some people don't pray that way, but they mean it that way. Thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, pastors, what? I know. Uh, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Wow. Who wouldn't want that guy in church? I give a tenth of all. Oh, this guy's crazy. The tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even dare go in further. He doesn't even dare to look up. How can he look up at God? He's humbled. And he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, who do you think went home righteous? Who went home right with God? The tax collector. When we imagine that somehow God owes us anything, or we imagine that we're somehow we're saved because we're smart or cute or whatever. We are like that Pharisee. Thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. You see all these druggies, all these losers, all these things. Oh, I'm not like any of them. I'm so clean. I'm so wonderful. No wonder you accept me. You can't come to God that way. Everyone comes to God the same way. By admitting that they are sinners. For all have sinned. All lack the glory of God. None are righteous. No, not one. We all come in through the same door. Through the acknowledgement that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. Christ has done on the cross what we could not do. He kept the law perfectly and died for us. This is what we're coming to celebrate today. We're coming to the Lord's table to remember what he did for us that we could not do for ourselves. If you imagine that salvation is in any other way than through Jesus Christ, God help you. God help you. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. A mercy, dear God, that you've always demonstrated throughout history. For you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you that we have the privilege of being called your people. Not because of our strength, not because of our intelligence, not because of our riches, but because of Jesus Christ. In him we stand clothed with his righteousness, clothed with his wisdom and his goodness, because there is no goodness in us. Thank you for your mercy. Bless us now, Father, as we come to your table. In Jesus' name, amen.